Hi, everyone, and welcome to Pathfinder, presented by Payload, the leading digital media company in the space industry. I'm your host, Mo Islam, and today we're joined by Jim Contral, the co-founder and CEO of Phantom Space, a company aiming to mass produce and fly small launch vehicles. Now, before Phantom, Jim has had a fascinating career in the industry, working for the French Space Agency, being a founding employee at SpaceX, and starting one of the first micro launch vehicle companies. We'll get into all this, but first, a word from our sponsors. Spider Oak's Orbit Secure software is designed for hybrid space operators struggling to manage the chaos of securing data flow and access to and from tens of thousands of small satellites in low Earth orbit. Using a unique combination of end to end zero trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, Orbit Secure allows your mission to orchestrate and secure Earth to orbit, orbit to Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure hybrid space environments. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero trust security and resiliency to your zero gravity environments, check out Spider Oak at www.spideroak.com. Jim, welcome to the show. Good morning. I appreciate you uh, you speaking to me on a Sunday. So yeah. I, I, I'm particularly grateful because uh, this is my first weekend recording of Pathfinder. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I really like what you guys are doing at Payload and uh, anything to help you out. I appreciate it. Uh, so um, let's jump right in. So there's an infamous story that we have to begin with, which involves you, Elon, and Russia. So let's start there. Tell us a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, given the headlines in Russia today, it's been on my mind uh, this weekend. You know, I was there during the, the first pooch, so I'm imagining what's going on over there today. But uh, back in 2001, it was a July afternoon in northern Utah, and my cell phone rang. And uh, it was some guy who I thought he said his name was Ian Musk. And uh, he <laughs> came to me and said, "Hey, uh, you know, I, I wanted to, I want to do this private mission to Mars, and I need a Russian rocket." And you're the guy I'm told to told to call. And I was on, you know, on my way home uh, to to after work, and I just said, "Hey, let me call you when I get home." So I did, and I got his fax machine, and I thought, eh. he said he was an internet billionaire. I thought he said that, and I thought, well, a billionaire doesn't, you know, call from a fax machine. He could probably afford more than a few phones. And uh, he, he called me about 20 minutes later, and he's, he's angry. And he said, why didn't you call me back? And I said, you know, I got your fax machine. And it's the only time he's ever apologized to me. I said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so anyhow, we talked some more. And, uh, you know, he, he, I guess he decided that, you know, I was the guy who needed to, needed to uh, do the work. And he said, uh, you know, can you, can you meet tomorrow? And, you know, where do you live? And I said, well, I live in Logan, Utah. Can you, you have an airport there? And I said, yeah, I can see it from my front porch. Yeah, no, would you, uh, you know, w- w- would you meet me tomorrow? And I'm, I'm thinking nobody like this is coming to my house, you know, because I've got kids and yeah. I don't know. You could sure. be a wacko. And uh, I didn't know what PayPal was. And uh, so I said, no, I said, I'll, I'll meet you uh, tomorrow or Sunday, rather, uh, behind uh, security in Salt Lake City because I've got to fly out on a Sunday. <laughs> and, and he said, OK. So then I did that because I knew he couldn't pack a weapon behind security. And uh, so that's when we... Uh, <laughs> That's where we met, and we met in what used to be called the Delta Crown Room. Now it's called the Sky Club. There was a, a conference room we could rent. So we met there, and I found out the guy was real. By the time I, you know, met him, I'd done enough research, and I found out it was Elon and not Ian. And uh, so suddenly, I saw the guy was pretty real. But you know, this wasn't all that unusual back in two thousand one to get calls from people who made a lot of money on the internet and wanted to uh, wanted to make things happen in in space. So. You know, it, it followed a pattern that I'd seen before with the Gross Brothers and some of the others, and uh, and so we put the plans together to go uh, buy rockets in in Russia. But you know, we first I put a team together, talk about the Mars mission because to buy a rocket we need to know what we're putting on it. And so I went back to my friends at JPL and some of my other rogue characters. Chris Thompson was one of them, uh, who's now our CTO at Phantom, and said, "Hey, you know, we got this guy who wants to pay us uh, to design a, a Mars mission." And uh, so that that team started the work. Eventually, you know, we decided what what vehicles would work, and we went over to Moscow on on at least two visits. Second one was with Mike Griffin, who later became the NASA administrator, and and Elon and I. And uh, we visited two places. First place, the uh, uh, Machina Stroya with the Strela. They uh, they they didn't take Elon seriously. I mean, he was a twenty something, poorly dressed, you know, by Russian standards. And uh, they they took that as a sign of disrespect, so they treated him with disrespect. And uh, Mike right. couldn't. And Jim, get what out. was um, I, what was the point of going on that 
trip, right? Like what, what were you guys looking to achieve? Yeah, we were, we wanted to buy vehicles, right? So Elon was not going to wait, you know, and think about it for a while. He just wanted to buy a couple of rockets. He wanted two missions and he wanted two rockets. So Machine Destroyer was the first one and Cosmotros was the other with the Nepper. And uh, for those of mm-hmm. you old enough to remember, the Nepper was kind of the rideshare program back before SpaceX. And uh, yeah, so so we were unable to uh, achieve our goal of uh, buying the rockets. Russians bid us goodbye, and uh, we went off into the November snow, Mike Griffin and Elon and me, and uh, thought we'd failed. And we got on the airplane to come home, and Elon uh, announces to Mike and me that we're going to build this rocket ourselves. And that was an act of sheer insanity in 2001. You can't imagine. You know, the, there were only four countries that had ever built uh, uh, launch vehicles that made it to space. There were there were some people that tried privately. Uh, Andrew Beal in Texas, namely, spent $100 million of his own money and then said, I've had enough. And uh, so, you know, Mike and I, our reaction was very skeptical. And uh, Elon... Uh, Elon had been doing work with this team of people I brought together and had, had apparently been going out into the desert and seeing them, uh, uh, you know, do, do these rocket launches with beer money. And so it was, uh, it was a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, sort of episode in history. And uh, I, I later wrote a book about it, uh, Breaking All the Rules, uh, you know, and expanded it really to include how, how do we even get to that point? Because there, there's a story of people who were just weren't happy with the nation state space programs and care for Soviet, French, American, and we just wanted to do things. And and that's really the, the spirit of the commercial space industry today that lives on. And we found like-minded people that, that would come along with us. What prompted him to call you, right? So, you know, at the time, I guess, like, who are you in the industry that Elon decided to reach out to you and say, hey, like, I want to do this ambitious program. This well, is the guy. I, I, yeah, I was always somebody known to know everybody, so to speak. And uh, Bob Zubrin was a guy I tried to uh, get a you know get a job with at, at Martin Marietta and now Lockheed Martin uh, back in uh, ninety two after the Soviet Union collapsed. I was working in France on a joint Soviet uh, French mission to Mars, and after the Soviet Union collapsed, I I said, well, I, I need to come home because uh, my job's probably going to be no more. And nobody would have me. And uh, I was considered a traitor uh, because I'd worked with the Soviets and maybe more with the French. And uh, so, so I went back to uh, Utah State, where I'd graduated from, the small space lab they had there. And, uh, you know, uh, Bob had uh, started the Mars Society by then, and by 2001. And uh, Elon uh, showed up at a Mars Society uh, gathering in Palo Alto one day after he'd been fired from PayPal. Um, he, I guess he got married and went on a honeymoon and came back and didn't have a desk anymore. So he decided to dedicate himself to this. And, um, that's, uh, that when, when, when Elon revealed to, to, uh, Bob Zubrin, his ambitions, Bob said, uh, you know, if you need Russian rockets, I know just the guy. All right. Interesting. Okay. So Bob was the one who made the connection initially. To be fair, after I'd come back from Russia and, uh, worked at, uh, Space Dynamics Lab, um, I, I was recruited to go back into the former Soviet Union and uh, help stop brain drain. So I'd help convert some of these ICBMs to uh, satellite launchers and so forth. We were just trying to keep the Russians busy so they didn't go to work for the North Koreans or the or the Iranians. Did you uh, did you lend Elon any of your books? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of famous, yeah. So during that summer when we were working on this this mission. You know, Elon asked me, he said, do you have any books on uh, rocket propulsion or launch vehicles? And I said, yeah, sure. So I, I gave him my college textbooks, you know, uh, Bates and Mueller Astrodynamics, which is kind of the standard in the in the industry. It was written in the 60s, but nothing better has ever been made. And uh, so he had my copy of that. And then uh, Rocket Propulsion by Sutton. And then uh, there was an AIAA book on, uh, on launch vehicles that uh, Sakowitz wrote, Steve Sakowitz. So, so, yeah, he took those, never returned them. But uh, that's okay. It's my contribution to the, <laughs> the world of science. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, so <clears throat> I do want to talk about. Um, let's talk about Phantom because, uh, and, and we'll fast forward a little bit now, and we'll we'll, we'll get back into more of your background um, later on in the show. But uh, Phantom, okay. So you, you you're you're starting, or you've started this launch company um, not too long ago. 
in uh, which is, I think, a pretty ambitious feat, uh, considering the market and and the players out there um, today. So maybe tell tell us a little bit about you know what is the value proposition of Phantom and what makes it different from the companies out there trying to do this. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so Phantom, we started in in, uh, in October of 2019, and we just wanted to be quiet about it. That's why we called it Phantom. But we seek to be the Henry Ford of space. And by that, we mean to apply mass production to first the launch vehicles, next the, the satellites, then ultimately to, to constellations to create an ecosystem in space that not only can launch and uh, develop the third party customer constellations, but eventually our own, much in the same way that SpaceX has developed its own constellation, Starlink which constitutes about 75% of their of their market value right now. So we, we think that, you know, launch is hard. We, we think that there aren't that many people that know how to do it. I, I liken it to Formula One cars. You know, there's a lot of guys in my neighborhood that could probably build one. There's only a few people that can actually get them to run and even less that can make them competitive. And uh, rockets are the same way. So we, we know that there's a limited talent pool out there. There's a capital barrier. There's uh, a there's also a mentality barrier, I would say, and uh, that's one thing place where we're different. Um, you know, a lot of people think that you have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to get it to work, and uh, we've spent about twenty eight million dollars to date to get uh, past a second fire, a second stage hot fire test, and we're close to uh, getting a first stage hot fire test done. Um, we think we can get to space for under a hundred million dollars. And uh, we've uh, used a, a, a unique supply chain approach compared to SpaceX, that is. And uh, to be fair to SpaceX, 20 years ago, you know, there was reasons to build everything yourself. Today, there's a lot of companies that have come out of SpaceX that, you know, for example, Ursa Major with their engines, we buy them there. Uh, there there's a lot of other piece parts and software that's available that, that really came out of SpaceX. So our business plan is really first to get the, the first vehicle up, which we call the Daytona which services the under 500 kilogram class of satellites, which is the fastest growing segment. Uh, it is also half the up mass from last year that went up worldwide. It's 95% of all the numbers of satellites that get flown. So it's clearly the dominant one. We believe that SpaceX will leave this market. Right now they service it with rideshare, which means you put maybe 50 or 100 satellites on one launch and you drop them off, kind of looks like a bomb going off in, in space. And the customers really want something that can place their satellites in a custom orbit on a, on a custom timeline. And right now you can't get a launch on SpaceX for at least two years. And uh, this is something that uh, is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And nobody wants to be relying on a single launch provider. So while there are others out there that like Rocket Lab who are doing this, they're, they're leaving this market um, and they're, they're actually uh, going to uh, go compete with the Falcon 9. A lot of us believe that the Falcon 9 will eventually become less of a priority for commercial launch and will serve as Starlink and, and the astronaut uh, type of flights as its sole uh, activity. And then then the uh, large uh, the large uh, Starship will be focused on interplanetary and, uh, and Starlink deployment. So, so that's why we want to do that first. It becomes a strategic asset that we can use then to build other people's constellations. And uh, we already have uh, several contracts there on, on satellites. We also have a uh, $300 million NASA launch services contract. It's a task order. We've won four launches there. Uh, we have 23 commercial launch uh, contracts in place. And uh, so we're ready to go. We just have to fulfill the rest of our obligation to build this and get it to space. Ultimately, we'll, we're going to build our own constellation like Starlink, but not competing with Starlink. And we think this is what the model has to happen in the future if to operate these rocket companies, these space transportation companies like airlines. And um, to that effect, you know, we've gone ahead and solved what we think is the choke point, which is the launch ranges. So we have 60 launches out of Vandenberg approved, and we just got a launch pad out at Cape Canaveral. And uh, we're working on one in the Bahama Islands with the, the government of the Bahamas. So so we, we plan to, uh, you know, try and be as lean as possible in the future and uh, make profit, which is kind of uh, an unknown word in some launch startups, but uh, we're, we're, we're focused on it. So, uh, Jim, I actually recently uh, did a bit of an analysis on the dollars um, raised and spent on uh, getting the orbit across some of the major startups 
major startups out there. And, you know, when you say 100 million to get to orbit at that payload class, uh, that's a pretty significant, uh, no, I would say, significantly less number than the than the w- what's out there. So I'm curious on your approach. Um, you know, speed clearly is part of the advantage. Um, cost clearly is one of the advantages, especially if you guys can get Daytona to orbit. Can we talk about reliability and how you think about reliability when you're talking about, um, you know, really leaning into a supply chain that's outside of your control in, in, in some ways? Yeah. So, so that's a good question. Uh, one of my backgrounds is automotive. And, uh, you know, when I started buying cars in my teen years, uh, you know, they were horrible cars. This was in the seventies and, uh, they were unreliable. But as time has gone on, they've gotten much, much more reliable through technology, through metallurgy, through, but, you know, ultimately through building more and more of them, having more experience with these vehicles. And I honestly don't know how many vehicles have been built worldwide, but clearly the more experience you have with them, the more reliable they get. So we think of, of reliability as being very important to the rocket industry. And we're borrowing the concepts from the automotive industry to make them reliable. We, we don't think that necessarily you, uh, you, you, you know, you design in and you process in, if you will, reliability. That's sort of NASA think, and it works, but it ends up with a very expensive product if you have limited production. And, and you have to realize to date, you know, the, the rocket industry has been very limited production, even SpaceX, they reuse their rocket. And there's a, in that reuse, they get a lot more experience. They've flown north of 200 rockets. And so if we're flying, you know, 300 rockets, that's, which is our ultimate uh, goal, 300 a year, we start to get some pretty significant experience with these things. And we believe as long as we're somewhat, uh, 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 some, somewhat, uh, uh, in self control of not changing the design every time it flies, that we can reap benefits from, from that, that side of the mass production. So we ultimately think that we can make these rockets as reliable enough to, uh, launch from some of these inland sites maybe 10 years down the road. Right now we have to launch over water because of the, the low reliability of these rockets. But you know, the, 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 not only do we want to be profitable, but we think like airlines, we can make these things very, very reliable. Right. So, so um, I, I'm curious, um, so much of the industry, launch industries, I should, or launch um, sector, I should say, um, is heavily focused on vertical integration. And, you know, owning the process um, and part of it is, you know, and I've spoken to a number of other CEOs who've said that, you know, it's integrating an, an engine into a structure is quite difficult and we want to own that process and we don't want to be beholden to any other, any other players. Um, why do you think the, um, you know, there aren't other companies out there taking this approach? Like, well, I guess, what are you seeing that's different? What are you seeing differently um, from the other CEOs out there? It, well, it's how you look at risk. Frankly, and right now in in the in the place before we've made significant revenue and we're not cash flow positive, you know there's a there's a huge financial risk, and and we like to think that our biggest risk, frankly, is capital formation. Can we raise the money? And so the less of that that you have to do, the better. So you have you have this this play between what do I have to pay for something like an engine from Ursa Major versus doing it ourselves, and you know, to develop a rocket engine is going, going to be at least a couple hundred million dollars. So if we can avoid that and we can get an engine at a price that, that makes our vehicle ultimately affordable, it's a no brainer in my book. And same with other parts. Now, uh, like we build our own valves, for example, we build our own tanks. We, of course, do our own integration. We licensed our avionics from NASA, got the software from them, you know, a very modest fee for that. And, uh, stuff all works, right? So back in 2001 or two, when we got going with SpaceX, this was an argument Elon and I had a lot. And uh, he was right that, that, you know, if you went into the supply chain as it was then, it was so expensive, you would make your rocket too expensive. And therefore you had to make it yourself. The second thing, which he was also very right about, was that the players at the time, namely Boeing and and Lockheed and, and Northrop Grumman, would uh, once they realized they had a competitor on their hand, they would retaliate through the supply chain, and they, you couldn't be beholden to that. So today we have a different risk. You know, our supply chain risk is: you know, do you have a reliable partner? Can they be trusted? You know, are they are they going to play games? So, you know, we're locked in with Ursa Major in a, in a very good partnership, 
and uh, we we think of them, uh, you know, as, as part of our team. And uh, you know, at some point in the future, uh, you know, we will probably in house a lot of things, probably not engines, but uh, you know, there's a lot of things we will in house that we can't buy anymore. And uh, that you know, some people I think take the the SpaceX playbook and just say, well, look, you know, it, it, this is how SpaceX did it. it; must be how we have to do it. In fact, I had an employee that came from SpaceX, a fairly senior person, um, that was was in there for two days, and uh, on the second day, he had a he had the whole place reorged under in his mind. He was a director level guy, and uh, he wanted everybody to report through him and him to report to me. And he said, "This is how SpaceX does it. If you don't do it, then you're not going to be successful." So we walked him out the door the next day. So so we we just we're thinking people, and and we question everything, and and we started with a clean sheet of paper. And this was one of the questions is, do we need to build everything ourselves? And the answer we came up with is, in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. So, you know, the other thing we've done is maintain an all U.S. supply chain uh, so that we can have a secure supply chain for defense applications, which is very, becoming very important. Right. Well, so, look, you make, you make a really good point because the capital piece of it arguably is the biggest risk. Um for all of these, for a number of these companies, especially companies that have had quite a bit of progress, I don't think that they're out of the woods even still because of the sheer amount of dollars that need to be raised in, in order to achieve what they're trying to achieve. And it's a big risk. And there's a possibility and potential scenarios that some of these companies, um, a number of these companies that I think may be considered like, you know, some of the key players, um, they could go away. Like I, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility just because of the sheer dollars that are needed in the market. So I think, I think, I think um, the the way you're describing this makes makes sense. Um, you know, of course, there's pros and cons to both both methodologies. Um, but curious, given um, your approach, like what is the current development timeline of Daytona? And I know you have something. I know you have a upgraded vehicle behind Daytona called Laguna. So maybe let's talk about how do you think about development timeline? Um, and let's assume. Capital is 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 not an issue for the time being. Like meaning, like you're you're able to 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 obtain the capital that you need in order to 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 execute. So yeah, we're we're just finishing our Series B. Uh, we've got most of the commitments lined up. We have a lead investor, Valerian Space Ventures. So that's been the the big thing for us. It's it's delayed our our development. We thought we would have this closed late last year. Here we are in June, and uh, we're we're getting it closed now. But the the issue is. Um, uh, you know, delayed our our uh, our development. So we're about a year and, and a quarter away from our first launch. We think the end of next year is the first launch of Daytona. We have engines sitting on our on our shop floor. You know, we just we just uh, uh, qualified our flight tanks. Um, we are building flight hardware for the first vehicle. Uh, we have the we have the launch sites. So so we're in pretty good shape. We turned in the uh, FAA uh, license application number of months ago. So we're ahead of schedule on that. It's really a capital deployment issue for us to get to that first launch to just sort of put an exclamation point on my last uh, comments. So once we have that first launch, we, you know, we're raising enough money to fly four of them out and uh, we'll fly those in pretty rapid succession uh, next, well, in 25. And then uh, we will be raising another round of money in late 25 because uh, this money will take us almost to 26. That we're raising, and uh, then by that point, uh, we'll start development on some new new vehicles, and we'll be ramping up production of Daytona. And we think we can double the uh, the, the flight rates every year. That's kind of what our what our model says. Laguna is a larger version, so Daytona is fully expendable. The Laguna is a reusable version of that, where we return the first stage back, pretty much how SpaceX does it. There's no reason to you know, reinvent the wheel there other than pride. Uh, so, so, you know, we like the landing leg approach. We need some bigger engines so that, you know, we're working with Ursa on some bigger engines for Laguna. And then uh, we'll, we'll have that operational, we think about 27. And then uh, following that, we have something we call Sebring. And if you notice a pattern in the naming, it's all after racetracks. And you know, Chris Thompson's a racer. I'm a racer. Mm -hmm. VP of engineering's a racer. So this, this is in our blood here. And uh, so Sebring is a fully reusable vehicle that the, we'll use the Laguna first stage to return. And then the second stage uh, on, the, on the Sebring comes back and it's a space plane uh, based uh, second stage. 
So that one should be probably operational 2029. That's a ways down the road. What is the uh, plan payload capacity of Laguna? So Laguna will be ex- in an expendable format will be about 1,200, 1,300 uh, kilos to orbit. And so in a, uh, in a reusable version, about 600. Uh, so it'd be up a bit from the Daytona. And this all is driven by engine sizing. And, uh, you know, we, we think that we know that the sweet spot in the market's about 500. And uh, we did that analytically when we first started. We could see that, that you know, the profitability peaked at about that point. Uh, and, and our sales have been very strong in this. So it's, it's a good match to the, to the market, it seems, at the moment. Markets change, right? So that it could, you know, 10 years ago, we saw a demand for smaller stuff. But Rocket Lab built to that, and they found out they have too small of a vehicle. So those things can happen. We don't see it, but it, it could come. So we're, you know, we're ready to. Uh, we're ready to to be nimble on that one, and and uh, part of the you know the gradual deployment of upgraded versions of this is is part of that strategy. Right now, is the Phantom Vision uh, just launch vehicles? Um, because I do know that uh, it, it it's a tendency for launch companies to to think about other products outside of the, you know the getting up into space. But are are you thinking about anything else for for the business? Yes. Yeah, we, uh, in fact, uh, our very first year in business were cash flow positive because we had a satellite contract. We built a uh, radar satellite for a commercial company and delivered the hardware. And uh, that is something that turns out our skill sets are, are, you know, cross over nicely. Uh, our VP of engineering, Val, uh, he, uh, he, he worked on some commercial sites. One of them is at the moon right now, uh, prior to coming. And, and so we speak both satellites and rockets. And uh, we, we think of the satellite industry as being two things. One, it's a bigger total available market to us, but it's also uh, something that we can create sort of captive customers, if you will. So we have several satellite constellations we're working with, we have agreements in place where we design, build, and fly out their constellation. And in the early days, we give them a pretty steep discount to help them along with capital formation and take a, uh, take a rev share or, a, or an equity position. With, with the company on the, on the backside. So that's, that's really our, our big model there. We'll probably be building eventually some of the piece parts. There's, there's, it turns out for U.S. defense applications, there's a criticality of, of U.S. availability of parts. And uh, you can go around the world and find the small sat parts. So we'll probably get into that kind of business. We already make uh, small plasma thrusters for small satellites. We license that from George Washington University. And ultimately, our own constellation, which we call Phantom Cloud, which is a, a data backhaul service. So think, think of it as as ground stations in the sky, and uh, that'll haul all back data back from the satellites, and then also from connected cars globally. So how do you? Um, so early on, how do you think about team construction? Because you know you're 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 working on a couple of different things. Um, not to say that the satellite piece of the business is is um, is a particularly big part of the business right now. But yeah, how have you thought about kind of early on team construction? Um, you you know you surrounded yourself by at least a couple very interesting um, uh, folks in the industry. But in general, as as you think about the team at large, so this is the most important thing you do with a startup, and I found this out through tough experience. But um, you know the team that you particularly your co founder, but also your key people. Are, are the most important thing you can do. And then, then you have to maintain that team spirit, if you will, or that, that consistency of, of the team as you hire on others. We, we're only 26 people. Uh, just to give you a sort of a relative size, uh, SpaceX during Falcon 1 was about 50 people, and they had an engine program. So, you know, you can do it with a lean crew, and they can be very efficient. So we, we look for people, first of all, that are like-minded, um, and, and by that, I don't mean political. I, I just mean, do they have the same basic values in life? Are they interested in the same thing? So w- we think of ourselves as builders, builders, doers, and, and makers. And so if you fit that category, you know, that you, that's the big wicket you got to get through. And then there's a mixture of, of experience and, and inexperience and energy, right? So as you get older, you have a little less energy, although I'm not showing it yet. Uh, now that now there's Chris Thompson, who's my CTO. Uh, but you know, we've, we have a very experienced senior team. Uh, you know, Mike D'Angelo is my co-founder. He's, he's got 35 years in the business like me and he's, he's 
been all, all, exposed much more to the venture capital and the, and the business management side. So he takes that part. Chris Thompson you know, was employee number two at SpaceX, and he's forgotten more about rockets than I'll ever know. And uh, he knows all the things not to do. And uh, so it's, it's like walking through a right. field of landmines. And, you know, that's how you, you know, when you ask the question, how do you do this so cheaply? The first thing you have to say is we don't make major mistakes. And if you don't make major mistakes, those are very costly. And you can only do that with experience. And that's why I say this, there, there's a dearth of that kind of experience out there. I'm not saying that, that the people who haven't done it before can't get it done because they can and do. But, you know, they, they sometimes spend a lot more money than you need to to get there. So we have Mark Lester, who uh, came on board uh, from Alaska uh, Aerospace. He ran the launch site up there in Alaska. So we had a focus on developing launch sites. So it made all the sense in the world. So that's that's the core of our senior executive team. And then the rest of the people, you know, it's people we know from our networks, people that have proven themselves. And uh, we're, we're hoping as we expand that our engineering team doesn't have to be huge because as we get done with the Daytona, we're going to roll them over to the Laguna. And then when that's done, we roll them over to the, to the Sebring. And, you know, we, we're not going to have hundreds and hundreds of engineers. We may have hundreds and hundreds of touch labor. Uh, I call it Joe six pack labor and, and, and Tucson's a great place for that. You know, we've got a weapons factory called Raytheon, not very far away that builds a lot of this stuff. So, so, you know, the team construction, you just have to get the right people in the right place and you got to watch out for, for management bloat. I, you know, I don't have an assistant. Um, I, I don't need an assistant. I do my own schedule and uh, nobody else has a system. But when you start getting into this business of having assistants and chiefs of staff and all this, then everybody's got to have their assistant before they, before you know it, you're at 900 people and you're burning $30 million a month. That's unsustainable, right? So, so the team is everything. Yeah. No, I think uh, uh, th- th- that's a, that's a great point. And I will say that, um, you know, one of the biggest things I've noticed or a big challenge that I w- witnessed um, or I have seen at other companies is, and it doesn't just have to be launched, but, you know, you're building a critical or very difficult piece of technology. There's a tr- ton, you know, you spend years and years and years and years on R&D, and then you finally get the thing to work. Um, and that's a huge success and step, but you're not out of the woods because you actually need to now transition into a manufacturing business from an R&D business. And that type of transition, especially if you don't have the right people, can 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 sink a business, right? Because you need to repeat, repeat, repeatedly build that piece of technology, which is difficult to do. And I think um so so your approach is what it sounds like is, you know, you have your kind of R and D phase, which I would call it, you know, maybe R and D light, because you're able to outsource some of the critical pieces of technology like propulsion. Um, and then, you know, once you get Daytona to work, then it's a question of, okay, well, we, we, we're we almost like this kind of quasi-manufacturing, but also integration business. So maybe you don't need that many people to be able to pull off that sort of next phase of scaling up the business. Am I thinking about that the right way? Yeah, that's that's the whole idea. You know, we, we have a pretty good model for touch labor on putting the vehicles together. And uh, that's, that's a lower cost labor category. And we brought in from day one, uh, somebody who's, who's done manufacturing, uh, Work both at Raytheon and for me in the past, and uh, they're they're involved from day one. So we have we developed the organization early on to to reflect what it's going to be later in terms of structure, and I think that's important because I've had an experience where I didn't do that, and that transitions touchier because the the people aren't thinking, the engineers aren't thinking about manufacturability. So leave an engineer, and I'm an engineer, so I can criticize others. Uh, that are engineers, but you leave an engineer by themselves and they'll make a ro- Rube Goldberg ab- device because it looks great. And I remember the first uh, version of our engine structure. We have nine engines on the first stage. And we looked at that and, and Chris and I just shook our heads. You know, we said, oh, all these links and all, all these Heim joints and all this. Yeah, sure, it would work, but it was a manufacturing nightmare. So we designed a sheet metal structure that we could right. uh, roll up and we're building that right now, right? And it, we're doing it with hand tools. Uh, so, so that's the kind of thinking you have to have that you embed this into the engineering approach. And, and this is again, where experience pays off. Right. No, that's a great point. I want to get into your uh, pre phantom days, but we're going to take a quick break, uh, Jim, just for a, uh, for a message from our sponsors. But when we come back, we're going to chat a little bit more about, uh, um, some of your, uh, some of your early days, or, or I would say earlier days. So stay with us. Space is the new frontier for cybersecurity. 
To quote the commander of the U.S. Space Force's Operations Command, cyber threats are unfortunately the soft underbelly of our global space networks. Spider Oak, the leader in space cybersecurity software, is dedicated to providing space operators with the solutions they need to protect hybrid space systems. Their Orbit Secure software uses a unique combination of end-to-end zero-trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, allowing missions to orchestrate and secure Earth-to-orbit, orbit-to-Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure LEO and hybrid space systems. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero-trust security and resiliency to your zero-gravity environments, check out SpiderOak at www.spideroak.com. Jim, welcome back. So I want to talk a little bit about Vector. So um, it was uh, one of the first companies you know, you've started. Um, you know, it was in the launch space as well. And I believe if I have my dates correct, it was sometime in 2015, 2016, when you started that company. Um, in, 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 in a way, right, you were uh, way ahead of the curve in terms of thinking about where the small launch market was at the time on the commercial side. Um, now, ultimately, Vector didn't work out. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about um, you know what went well um, at the company, but then what were the key challenges at the time, and maybe some of your kind of early learnings from those key challenges. Yeah, so so yeah, you're right. We started it in uh, 2015, and it ended. At least my involvement ended in August of uh, 2019, and it went on to become bankrupt after I left. And uh, you know, the, the the things that worked well. Let's start there. I think you're right. We were early to the market. You know, Chris Thompson and I were the proponents of the Falcon 1 back in the early SpaceX days, which is about a Daytona-sized vehicle. And, uh, you know, we saw that this future of making a lot of them and launching a lot of them was a cost-competitive way against large reusables, which we see Falcon doing now. SpaceX took that direction because they ultimately have a goal of Mars. If you want to do commercial, we think this is another alternative to it. All transportation systems, as you look around the world, have multi-mode kinds of transportation. So that's what we saw early. Uh, that was really my idea. Uh, and I went up and gathered uh, Garvey Spacecraft Company to to get a kickstart, a jump start, if you will. They've been working on this since the SpaceX days, these small vehicles. Theirs was smaller, too small for the market. Um, and, you know, but nonetheless, we started there. Uh, and uh, I think we had a very good early market lead there. We raised a lot of money. Um, I raised uh, over a hundred million dollars, and and Sequoia was our was our Series A lead, and uh, along with Lightspeed, so we had all the brand names involved. And uh, you know what, what what went wrong was a couple of things. It started with the engine development, which, uh, as I look back at it, it w- I don't think that engine would have ever worked. And uh, you know we didn't have the right people in the room for that. Had had I had Chris Thompson there, who I do now. Uh, he, he, in fact, he wanted to get involved and through various uh, sort of personality conflicts with the other founders, um, we didn't bring him in. And that, that would have that would have been the right thing to do. But uh, the engine started, the engine program started stalling, consuming a lot of money. And uh, quite frankly, the investors got tired of, of the delays. And uh, when they saw the founders starting to fight because, you know, finger pointing starts in, you you told me to do this fast and we can't do it fast. It's going to take all these years. And you told me it was all ready. And, you know, so this is kind of finger pointing, uh, let Sequoia just say we're out. And, uh, that collapsed the financing round that we we're in. We still had money in the bank. Um, then I left and, uh, I left because I'd brought in financing that could have saved the company, but the, the other founders had other ideas for the company. They wanted to split it up and go their own separate ways. We had a, a really a, a very strong, uh, portfolio of IP and in, in the satellite side with with software defined satellites using uh, some you know some concurrent uh, uh, networking technology but on the satellite side and uh, Lockheed ended up buying that out of the bankruptcy so so what did I learn um, the first thing kind of to your earlier question team the team is everything your 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 co-founders are everything it's it's almost even more important to choose them well than it is to choose a marriage well you know your your spouse or your your life partner whatever it is and uh, getting out of these things is painful and expensive but uh you know you you have to really make sure you're very well aligned uh just in in your mentality and and how you see things and really kind of a, a, on a morality basis you know what's what's your sense of right and wrong and what would you do because you don't know 
how people are, really are until things get tough. And you, you know, you think you know somebody for 20 years and then you find out they behave completely differently when the, when the chips are down. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing I learned, uh, which we've applied to Phantom, which is you, you just don't spend any money until you absolutely have to. We thought we could solve the engine problem with money and it was wrong. So that, you know, it, 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 there's an old phrase, you can't put lipstick on a pig because it annoys the pig and it doesn't do any good. Well, that, that's kind of where we were with the engine program and we should have, uh, we should have gone a different direction. In fact, Ursa Major was knocking on my door back then and I was talking to him. Um, but, uh, you know, the co-founders that the engine was their baby. So you, you know, you're sort of stuck there, but back to the point of spending money. Um, you know, the other thing that some of our, our investors and board members urged us to do was to build out the manufacturing capability so we could scale it. And they brought software thinking to the table, which really wasn't applicable. So we spent a lot of money on that, that we shouldn't have spent. So if you go to Phantom today, we have 50,000 square feet and about 20,000 of its air conditioned, the rest of it, not. And uh, why? Because I don't want to spend the money. And and it served me very well. We've survived this valley of death in the financing world, which I think a lot of other companies besides Virgin aren't going to. And uh, that that cheapness is is part of what's done it. And uh, you pay your people well, but you don't spend money on things you don't absolutely have to have. And uh, you know, a couple of my guys came to me the other day and said, "Hey, your golf cart's out in the out in the high bay. Can we use it to to?" you know, motivate us a, a, a slosh experiment. I said, yeah, sure. I love that kind of thinking. Right. And that, that's what we've embedded in the entire company. We didn't have that at Vector. So I, I wish Vector would have worked. Um, you know, they got the assets got bought and there's, uh, you know, by uh, Robert Spalding and his group. And I knew, I knew Spalding from when he was on the White House uh, National Security Council. And I think they have a lot more focus on defense applications, which that size of rocket really is well suited for. It's probably not well suited for the uh, the, the satellite launch market. So wish wish them well. I, I like those guys, and uh, it was it was a great learning experience. I just wish it wouldn't have been as painful. Now, um, I, I do have a question about the the venture um, capitalist side of all this. Um, I, I'm curious, right? Because in in 2015, 2016, especially that early, really there was. The only other company out there that was um, on on the launch side that was that was remotely investable, right? It was SpaceX. At least that was the, the general kind of consensus amongst the investor community. How did VCs at the time think about the space industry, um, and how do you think that that's changed today? So, like, what were um, you know? Because th- that was as far as as venture capitalists are concerned, that was pretty early days to be investing in a space company. I mean, and I know that's not very long ago, but but it, it certainly was. Yes, it was. Yeah, so the VCs were fascinated by space. It was cool, right? And that if you go back in the history, of course, SpaceX being successful made it safe for investing in space, but there was still a very slow uptake on that. So my first experience with this was actually Skybox Imaging, and I helped those guys and uh, helped them you know, raise their Series A and B. They eventually sold to, sold to Google for five hundred million dollars, which was fantastic. They 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 were building imaging satellites, and uh, that was super early days. And and they got Kosla led their first round, and I can't remember who led the second round, uh, but it was all Silicon Valley VCs. And once the VC saw that, there were several that that re upped that came back in to that, and then then you got the interest from Sequoia in that. But I remember so many days on Sand Sand Hill Road. With uh, you know the door effectively slammed on my face, they were polite about it, but you know nobody nobody wanted to take their money and deploy it into space. They, I don't think they had an appreciation of how big a market it is. It's really a frontier, and you know it's it's a lot like you know the new world was was five hundred years ago when the Spaniards were first coming here. Nobody has any idea what we can do in space. Truly, we don't. We we, we believe it's big, but it's probably bigger than we can even imagine. And uh, um, my view is almost anything you do in space that you can control your costs, make a profit, and continue on is going to be massively successful, like SpaceX, right? There's more SpaceX is waiting to be founded and, and, and made. Uh, you know, Andrel's one that I'm seeing today, you know, that, that they just bought uh, Adranos, and, uh, who's a portfolio company of, of Bolarin, who's leading our, our, our Series uh, B round. And, uh, you know, they're a defense company. So, so a lot has changed since then. 
um, and, and the VCs are seeing it. But the, the, the mistake the VCs make is they treat it like a software uh, process that you can turn in three years. And their funds are structured so that they, you know, they need a three-year turn on a lot of these things. So they get really impatient. And, uh, you know, space people aren't really good at forecasting their timelines either. Um, I think there's a lot of learning and improvement that can be made there. So between those two things, you've got a ready-made disaster. We're finding family office money is much more consistent with with this uh, space business. And they don't have, I call it a Ponzi scheme-minded approach, which uh, it's not really a criticism of VCs. But, you know, you want to, in, in a VC world, you want to build up the value of something so you, as high as you can. So that's why you want to scale it early. And that's why I got the advice I got at Vector. And then you want to you want to sell it on the market and, and return to your fund and go do it again. And space is not like that. This is a this is a five to ten year capital commitment to get to where SpaceX is. I mean, they're twenty years old, and they're worth what one hundred and fifty plus billion dollars. So they're one of the most valuable companies out there. And uh, to do that, it's, it's just not going to happen in a few years. And uh, you know, you're, you're building something that's probably, if you get to that point, it's much more stable in terms of revenue, in terms of valuation, and so on. So the payoff is good. And family offices, you know, are used to that kind of thing. They're used to investing in oil and real estate and these other things. Uh, so, so they tend to be more comfortable with the entrepreneurial risk and the, and the timeline. Uh, whereas, whereas the VCs, they're coming around, right? They're, and, and, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, for example, has their American Dynamism Fund and they're, and they're looking at this as being a place to put money because it's good for the country. It's good for the world, frankly, freedom around the world. And uh, it's good for their bottom line, but they have they have that sort of patient thinking about it. Yeah, are there um, do, do, are there any other verticals in the industry, in the space industry, I should say, that aren't that folk are focused too much on vertical integration and should be taking your sort of Henry Ford esque approach? Is there any anything else out there that you've kind of identified? Yeah, I think satellites are that, definitely that. Um, and there's enough supply chain out there. The reason satellites have gone from hundred million dollars each to a million dollars each for a you know typical imaging satellite supply chain and and enough people are building enough stuff. The problem is is that uh, you know again like Blue Canyon got bought by Raytheon and I think Raytheon will completely ruin the company. That's my prediction because they ruin every company <laughs> they touch. Uh, my wife was a Hughes employee and they Raytheon bought them and they ruined Hughes. Uh, but that's sort of the creative destruction of capitalism, right? So that's happened here uh, in the United States. There, there's there's not enough supply chain for satellite uh, components here, but you can buy it worldwide. So if, if people want to spend, you know, what I believe is scarce, otherwise scarce capital on developing their own technology for something that you can buy, to me, that's irresponsible, right? Uh, so, so, you know, where the, where the money really needs to go is into the application side. So what what new, new and unique ways can we create value from space? Is it is it simply putting bits from point to point on the Earth through space, which is a great application we all know about? Is it turning photons into decision quality information? There's a whole value chain there. The sensors, how can we get new new kinds of value out of photons? You can convert them into digital data. And then how do you take that digital data and turn that into decision quality information? If you're a hedge fund manager, if you're a farm manager if you're i don't know gallo wine for example how do you move your how do you move your stuff around to to you know account for the harvest which happens all at the same time there's just there's just so many pieces of that value chain that ought to be developed and in the analytical side i think this is where the some of the satellite imaging guys make make mistakes they say well we want to be the analytics guys but the analytics guys really need every bit every bit of data they can't just you know rely on one proprietary stream of data that comes from your satellite. That's, I think, a big mistake where people are trying to vertically integrate in the, in the space business, you know, and then propulsion is another one that, you know, I'm, I'm obviously a big fan of, of, you know, these other companies. So, so forever and ever, um, you know, Thiokol and then ATK and now it's Northrop Grumman uh, were the only ones besides Aerojet in the United States making solid rocket motors. And suddenly they're starting right. coming out there and this is healthy. This is good. And uh, the, because solid rocket motors got so expensive. Is a government, you know, that was paying for all of them. And uh, just like when you're married to somebody for 25 or 30 years, you start to act and talk like them and think like them. You know, when you do business with the government for your entire life, you start to act like the government. And I don't think any of us would agree that 
that, that the government's more efficient than the private sector. So I'm really happy to see that happen. Are there, uh, are there companies, and I would say uh, outside of your supply chain currently, um, that you are excited about or that you're following and you're, uh, you, you, you appreciate what they're, what they're working on and what they're doing? Yeah, Ardranos, I mentioned them earlier. They just got acquired by Andrel. That came out this morning in the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited about what they're doing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited also about Ursa Major. There's, uh, there's a lot of 3D printing capabilities out there. It's, it's kind of amazing. You really don't need to in-house that either. So, uh, uh, you know, Brad Kozlowski, who's the famous NASCAR racer, he's actually better, in my opinion, <laughs> Brad will probably slap me for saying this, he's better at manufacturing stuff. He's got Kozlowski Advanced Manufacturing. He's got a terrific 3D printing setup. So a lot of that manufacturing core that, that doesn't need to be replicated inside companies is really growing. I'm excited about how that, how that whole sector is really coming along. And then, and then I'm waiting for somebody, and this is kind of my challenge to the industry, to make those breakthroughs in propulsion, you know, we're, you know, I just got through telling you how we need to run this like a, like an airline, but, you know, propulsion is the same as it was more or less for the last 50 years, maybe, maybe a hundred years. And with the exception of advancements in printing, 3D printing and uh, some, some metallurgy, by and large, it's, it's not changed. So I'm looking for those things that allow us to go to the stars, right? That, that, that will fundamentally change the rocket equation and take that tyranny away. What do you um what do you think about some of these companies out there that are trying to re uh re I don't know if reinvent is the right word but like change the way that we get to orbit. So, you know, um there's some single stage to orbit type planes that are out there that have a combination of existing techno existing propulsion technology combining it with sort of air breathing propulsion technology. I what do you think about some of those um, more, I would say, uh, on, on the frontier type companies that are trying to get to orbit in, in, in a rather different way. Yeah, I'm very supportive of what they're doing. Um, you know, they're, they're, I think of them as technology companies, not, you know, true sort of operational companies. And when you, when you look at Phantom, the way to think of Phantom is, you know, we do the development we have to do, but we're really, we're like Southwest Airlines. We just have to build parts of the airplane, right? We don't build everything, but unfortunately, nobody else does, and we have to do that. But these other companies think of as the Pratt and Whitney's of the world, or the, you know, I don't know, the experimental, you know, aircraft companies, and and you know what they're doing is advancing the ball down the down the path, yeah, that eventually get adopted. And uh, so, you know, yeah, if you don't have to carry your oxidizer with you and, and breathe the oxygen in to go up, that's that's fundamentally a better way to get there. It's more efficient. Um, that, you know, if you, uh, uh, do like, uh, spin launch does and, and spin yourself up to Mach seven inside a, a, a concrete carsophagus, I, you know, with all due respect to my friends out there, it looks like a <laughs> weapon system to me, an ASAT system and, uh, doesn't seem too practical. Right. So there's some things that probably will never be very practical for us. Uh, but you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say that any of these are going to revolutionize you know, somebody's going to come along and say, hey, we've got this thing that goes single stage to orbit, breathes air, gets there, and we're going to get the cost down because the technology is not mature enough. You know, we're, we're, you know as we do our analysis, we can get our, our costs with this fully reusable Sebring under $1,000 a kilo, our internal costs, right? And, and that's pretty right. aggressive. So there's a point of diminishing returns that comes with that. And, but, but that's why I see these things as all incremental improvement. Yeah, no, I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, I have I have one last question, Jim, because I know we're running out of time here. Um, I had Tom Mueller here on the podcast a few weeks ago, and I asked him a question, um, and it's something that you brought up earlier in the conversation. So I want to ask you too, which was uh, building a winning Formula One car, <laughs> and what would be more difficult for you, which is winning a Formula One racing car or building a uh, a a uh, launch vehicle from scratch. So I'm going to th- toss that question to you because I'm curious about your answer. And I always, I also find it fascinating how many, how many of you guys are into racing, you and, and Tom and, and of course, Chris. Um, but yeah, I'm curious your perspective on that. <laughs> well, yeah, to put it in perspective. So, you know, after I get done here, I'll probably go work on one of my race cars. I, I've built dozens of race cars from, from the bottom up. I, I have two that I've designed from the start and, uh, 
am in the process of, you know, getting the frames built and so on that, that I'll be building over the next few years. So it's a, it's a complete passion for me. I don't have enough money to build a Formula One car. That's, that's in the, in the tens of millions of dollars kind of thing. So, or more. And uh, so, so I've never had any experience with that, but it's a good question. So I, I, I actually understand the path to getting to building a rocket from scratch because uh, we're doing it uh, better than I do building a Formula One car. And I've got uh, you know, more experience at it and I know how to raise capital for it. I don't know how to raise capital for a Formula One team, uh, although I could probably go to my Andretti uh, family <laughs> friends and, and ask them because they're doing it, you know. So uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, I would say Formula One car would be harder for me, actually. it's a, People don't realize how hard that stuff is. There's so much subtlety. It's it's just like rockets. There's so much subtlety in in making them competitive, making them operate. Uh, you know that's why I'm forever fascinated with race cars. You know I have a, a, a I used to drag race a long time ago. I road race now mostly, but you know, I've gotten this fascination again with building a uh, nitro methane powered uh, Hemi powered uh, dragster. So I'm I'm doing that in my spare time, but it's it's part of the you know the learning process. I just want to master that skill and uh, that that knowledge base. Yeah, you know, it's it's. I, I ask because it is. Uh, as I've, I've I've learned more about cars over the years, and, and uh, it is fa- absolutely fascinating, especially at the highest level of racing, how difficult it is to build something yes, slightly is. better, right? Yeah. And it's uh, it's the the pushing the pushing the boundaries of performance is 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 it's it's fascinating. It's what what folks do and what engineers come up with in yeah. order to do so. Yeah, just a prologue on that point. You know, the, the the most success I've had in building cars is making them reliable. We we put a number of cars in these twenty four hour, twelve hour events, and that's a whole other skill set, right? Is to build these things that are fast, but yet still reliable. So at Le Mans, for those of you that watched it, there was a Garage fifty six entry, which was a NASCAR car, and 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 everybody cheered when it finished, right? Because nobody's ever run a NASCAR. For 24 hours, and uh, that that that's that's really the the thing that interests me. But Jim, thank you so much for for being on the show. It was a pleasure. Um, really appreciate it. Really appreciate you joining on on a Sunday. Uh, I know you have uh, a lot uh, a lot of things to do uh, and 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 cars to drive. So I'm going to let you get back to it. And uh, excited to have you back on the show at, at a later date. Okay, take care. Everybody.